Hello, and welcome to the Spring 2022 City Design and Development Forum at MIT, hosted by the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning. We have today a special lecture. This lecture is co-sponsored by the City Design and Development Group and the International Development Group. And as we'll see, the topic of this lecture is very appropriate to both challenges of international development and challenges of city development. So we're very happy to be collaborating with the International Development Group on this lecture. In a moment, we'll be introducing Trita Banerjee, speaking about in the images of development. Just like to say that this is our final lecture of the spring semester, and we're looking forward to an exciting fall semester of lectures as well. So please stay tuned over the summer of 2022 for additional lectures that will be coming up in the fall. Again, I'm Brent Ryan, the head of the City Design and Development Group at MIT. I turn the floor over to Arthi Janakiraman, who will introduce Trita Banerjee. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. I'm pleased to welcome and introduce our speaker today, Professor Trudip Banerjee. Um, Trudip is Professor Emeritus of Public Policy in the Sorpress School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. He is no stranger to MIT, having completed his PhD in Urban Studies and Planning right here at DUSP. He has previously, previously served as Associate Dean um, of the former USC School of Urban and Regional Planning and Vice Dean of the USC School of Policy, Planning and Development. Trudib's research, teaching and writing has focused on the design and planning of the built environment and the related human and social consequences. In particular, he's interested in the political economy of urban development and the effects of globalization in the transformation of urban form from a competitive international perspective. His most recent book is titled In the Images of Development, City Design in the Global South. It examines contemporary cities in the global south and the endogenous possibilities for the future design of these cities that may address growing inequality and the environmental crisis. Thank you so much for joining us today, Thridib. Um, the floor is yours. All right. Um, so um, thank you very much, um, Brent and um, Arthi and Bish, for inviting me uh, to this um, special uh, seminar on. Uh, design and development. Um, uh, in fact, the it kind of uh, uh, captures the theme of my book and the presentation, which is the connection between design development and urbanism, and really advanced urbanism or uh, inter intermediate urbanism. Um, I should note also that it is a true honor to be uh, invited at MIT, my alma mater, and um, you know, even though it is a virtual visit, I'm very pleased to have been invited for this uh, session. Uh, about the book, I, I, I don't know how many of you have uh, seen or had a chance to read it. I think, Brent, you told me that uh, in your class, uh, your requirement for the first and last chapter, uh, and some of you have read the whole thing. And again, for Bish and Diane, thank you for your wonderful uh, endorsement on the back cover of the book. So I'm ever so grateful to you all. Um, I should begin by noting that the book is not written as a handbook uh, with the design solutions for the global self. Uh, I see this more as a beginning of a conversation, um, which is long overdue, I believe between the scholars and practitioners of built environment, development, and comparative urbanism. Uh, the armature of this conversation is quite broad, uh, going back to the pre-colonial legacies of the global south. Um, now, there is a saying that the, um, a good novel does not always begin open at the beginning of the story. Uh, the cover of the book and the artwork uh, that uh, goes with it, which is explained in the one of the chapters in the book, uh, is a um, is kind of sort of suggests that. Uh, and the very first chapter, uh, in the spirit, and also not beginning with only the opening of the conversation. So, um, um, why, why, why can't you move right here? So um, 
the story goes back about 20 years ago when I had a chance to visit Indonesia for some consulting work in Jakarta. Uh, I remember I spent a week there and there's one day, which was kind of a free day. And some of our, my former students said, well, I will take you to uh, Bandung for a kind of a tour. And Bandung we met by one of the, uh, our alums and professor at BIT. And so he gave me a tour of Bandung. And then finally he said, uh, Judy, would you like to see our gated community? Uh, at that time, gated community was becoming quite popular in Los Angeles and people were coming all over the, from all over the world to sort of look at the gated communities in Los Angeles. Uh, so I was kind of struck gated community in, uh, in Indonesia, in Bandung, fall place. So uh, they, they took me there and um, uh, they're selling these units, as this is from the pictures from this catalog, uh, of four types of townhomes. Uh, they're named Amsterdam, Paris, London, La Roma, and there's some floor plans, which you can see are very, very Western style for floor plans, very Western style, style lifestyle. And I was busy taking picture. My, my uh, friend said that, listen, if you think this is interesting, you should go visit um, Kota Usata and Kota uh, Legenda, two other projects done by the same developers in Jakarta. So when I went back to Jakarta on my way to the airport, I asked them to kind of drive me by those uh, new towns or planned communities. And, uh, and, and indeed, it turned out that, uh, uh, why is that? Yes, yeah, turns out that they are quite a treat. Now, so this is the uh, sales office of Kota Usata, which is, you know, Disneyland, uh, uh, you know, kind of maximized in some fashion. Uh, it's like a Alice in the Wonderland. It's, and then the um, uh, their downtown, uh, which is still under construction, uh, also very much like uh, uh, Disneyland. Uh, I remember the Kevin Lynch, uh, I once had an opportunity to take Kevin Lynch to Disneyland. When he was visiting in LA, he wanted to go see the plastic tree in Disneyland. So I, I remember that occasion when Kevin pointed out that, you know, these buildings are all done seven, eight full scale. The Disney designers are very clever and they've done that because, uh, so you get a, what I call a Gulliver effect that you are slightly in a kind of a Lilliputian land to make it slightly kind of unreal. But this is all, um, so this is, you know, the architecture of Alpine, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what you call them, a mixture of um, styles, mainly Western, nothing Indonesian about them. So these, uh, ex this experience quite struck me. And, um, and by the way, I you should say that uh, I'm not, picking on Indonesia in particular, because this is happening all over the world today. And as you all know that China particularly is in the forefront of the recent, um, uh, the nine town, one city uh, master plan for Shanghai, uh, which uh, you know, calls for nine new towns and each new town is designed by a particular European style of uh, architecture and planning. And I'll have an image later on, I can show it to you. And in India, you have a development in Mumbai called uh, Hiranandini. Sorry, uh, I think so, Hiranandini is called, um, which is also done in very sort of a classical Western style. So the question that comes to mind is why is it that as you see this new emerging uh, uh, urban uh, form, in the global south, there's an absence of a kind of what you can call the autonomous spaces and images of develop, development and modernity. Uh, I mean, there are some alternative hypotheses. Some are a little bit tongue in cheek kind of thing. So, like, we can begin by kind of a skippingish notion of the poverty of ideas. This is the white man's burden argument that inherently the developing world doesn't have much talent or imagination and so forth. But more, more appropriately, I think uh, the, uh, under, under Frank's argument, it's a development of underdevelopment. 
uh, as a result of the colonial period. Uh, Edward Said's Orientalism provides another kind of hypothesis uh, that the, the colonial design and the and the the colonial design and subaltern and the, of the indigenous has been kind of propagated during the colonial time. Uh, Burman's um, modernity in the tragedy of development provides another perspective, which I address in one of the chapters. And generally, the, the phenomenon of globalization, where the movement of capital, people, culture, and ideas, that leads to this kind of a contamination, cosmopolitanism, hybridity, uh, that will come to that at the end of my presentation. And uh, uh, one of our former doctoral students, uh, Rafael Pizarro, who's teaching at uh, uh, American University in Dubai, he wrote a, a dissertation on what he called the Hollywood Urban Imaginarium. And he was interested in looking at the new suburbs in Latin America. And he was looking at Colombia, where he's from. And he argues a lot of it is sort of a, a, a result of the uh, folks watching uh, Hollywood films and the kind of uh, uh, survey imagery that's portrayed in uh, Hollywood film production that actually sets uh, the style and preference. But associated with that is uh, uh, some other, the literature also sort of, a, kind of a talks about this, this, this identity and authenticity, the absence of endogenous modernities, the kind of a sense of loss of place, community, uh, tradition, and cultural continuity, um, enduring, if not exacerbated, inequality, polarization, segregation. And then the question of sustainability more recently, the context of global warming, on the pace of scale of development, and then the generally speaking, <clears throat> globalization and its discontents, which is the title of a nice book review that uh, Benjamin Barber wrote. Uh, with books actually expressing the discontents uh, with uh, globalization. Uh, in fact, Amit Shen did a talk at Harvard some years ago. The title of his talk was The Global Doubt. <laughs> and so, so these are some anti-globalization uh, uh, kind of um, reaction. So the urban outcomes of becoming global um, uh, the test, uh, what we find is that there is a kind of growing a kind of a market orientation, a kind of a significant transformation of the state and the governance, marketing and branding of cities, uh, polarization, income inequality, exclusion of the poor from the globalized spaces, enclosure of the commons, the rights of the gated communities, shrinkage of the public realm, unsustainable scale and speed of development and the environmental damage and then contamination and multiculturalism is going with it. So the book uh, is organized uh, basically, um, so that is sort of how we set up the uh, introduction opening of the story. Uh, the beginning uh, goes back much farther back historically, but essentially I have, the book is organized in three uh, parts. In you know, the first part is more theoretical uh, review of the literature and arguments and debates uh, in these three chapters. The second, uh, so the, I call it, uh, do that all discussion about development and urbanism. Uh, the second part uh, looks at the pre-colonial and the colonial legacies of city design. Uh, the um, uh, the canonical city is about the traditional classical design of cities in the Chinese and Indian cities of the pre-industrial, uh, pre-modern urban form. Um, the second chapter is a, it's a long title, Piety, Community, Autopoiesis, and Aesthetics. I'm, I'm a little bit, this is one of my favorite chapters because I think I was able to capture the essence of what normally called as Islamic city. The, I didn't use the term Islamic city because it has become controversial because some of the scholars from Islamic countries, so-called Islamic countries, have questioned the use of the term uh, because of its um, kind of 
political religious uh, uh, implications. Then finding the colonial project, which is the beginning of the colonial era. And then part three, which is the, the last part where uh, the several chapters beginning with the post-colonial utopias, look at some of the import of design paradigms, um, the spectacle poverty and inequality that continues unabated, the Faustian imperative, which I basically I draw from Marshall Berman's uh, classic book, the All That is Solid Melts Into Air uh, title, uh, the place of Medina, but it should be place of Medina, not place, and they're looking ahead uh, from the Ladonia as they're concluding. And then I have an epilogue, which is uh, talk about best practices and some examples. Um, but let's begin with a few things about the development. So one of the things, um, uh, well, I think about the interesting thing about the word development is that it didn't kind of come into the, um, become a popular concept until middle of last century. Before that, the notion of economic development didn't exist. And so the develop, and this is what um, H. W. Aaron, the economist, uh, who all pointed out. And I think that has something to do with the time when the most of the developing world, which were previously colonized, became independent. Now this chart shows the um, the uh, total real purchasing power parity based GNP, the historical trend. So if you go back to 1750, oops, what happened? Yeah, if we go back to the beginning of the uh, uh, 18th century, 1750-ish, around that time, you see that the, 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 da the dash line, uh, big dash line, um, is the share of the what you call today developed countries, and a small short dash line is what you could call the so this is the global north and global south, let's say. And if you so the global north's uh, GNP total real GNP used to be higher than that of that. I mean global south GNP used to be higher than the global south in 1750. And uh, uh, then, that, of course, this is the colonial beginning of the colonial era. Uh, but at that time, 1750, China had some made some amazing advances in technology, industry, and other things. India is a huge uh, uh, agricultural kind of a heartland of produce an enormous amount of uh, food and. Uh, products and at that time. Um, so the it, it, it was sort of the reverse of what we, we see today. And then if you look at the, the that the solid line, which shows the percentage share of the world GNP for the developing countries, it, it begins to decline until about the um, latter half, half of the last century, which is a time when the, these countries became independent and then finally, the share started to grow up largely because of the role of China, but India and Brazil and some other, Indonesia and some other developing countries, which did quite quite well. So that so that uh, uh, two hundred years of uh, history, colonial history, in fact, shows the 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 the. the inequality between the two countries. And when the, these countries became independent, their coffers were empty. When the British left India, uh, Pakistani side didn't have any money left. And so finally, Indian, uh, the uh, advocacy of Gandhi, they gave some share of money to Pakistan. So these countries are pretty much bankrupt. They absolutely didn't have any, any fund, any money at all. Um, so that's the, one of the background of the development history, and I think this partly explains this argument, the questions I'm raising earlier, why is this disparity today? Um, next slide, please. Oops. So, uh, of course, um, and the question has been raised, why poor countries are poor, and rich countries getting richer, 
one argument, classical economic argument, well, this is just, uh, it's going to work out to the trickle down process, the economic benefits will trickle down uh, to the lower. So don't worry, uh, be patient. <laughs> this story was actually captured by uh, Simon Kuznets, a Nobel laureate, who wrote this famous book on the modern history of the modern economic history of um, the Western world or something like that. And it is a very solid uh, uh, empirical research which showed that in the Western countries, uh, in the early stage of their development, uh, there was uh, inequality was not that good, great. But as these countries began to develop, the inequality uh, largely in the pre-industrial economy uh, started to started to grow. And then um, uh, eventually it started to level off and then finally went to decline. So the inequality was high, but it came down to uh, as much lower levels. But the question is that what, what is that inflection point? The folks in the developing countries are asking, well, so, so the idea being to the advice from the developed economies to the uh, developing uh, global south economy that don't worry be patient it's going to work out uh, you know as you saw it's in it, you know, it that's kind of showed so the economies of the developing countries are saying but at what what's in what are the numbers at what gdp per capita what is the inflection point uh, so monte galualia was uh, a uh, World Bank economist at the time, I think he became a financial advisor of Manmohan Singh, which was one of the ministers um, later on. He did a um, sort of a cross-sectional uh, kind of a regression analysis, have a kind of quadratic logarithmic <laughs> uh, functions and all that. And he found it's true that the these uh, Kuznets um, premise data does show cross country that there is that kind of a change. But if you we, if we thought the, at that, that time, this was the article written in the 70s, at that time India's GDP per capita was something like 250, $250 or $300. So it'll take uh, like up to 1100 or 1200 per, per capita to reach that inflection point, which means India will have to wait for another 50 or some countries, maybe even 100 years to get that inflection point. Um, so obviously that was not quite uh, sort of acceptable. Um, the good that the bell curve has been, um, uh, uh, you know, much discredited since then. Uh, in fact, uh, Thomas Piketty, the French economist who wrote the book Capital, said, well, this was really kind of a Cold War kind of thing uh, that basically telling uh, poor people not to become socialists, stay with the capitalist mode because eventually it'll work out. Um, so, but, um, but, but interesting thing about, about this, however, well, the economists are saying that, well, it will work out, but it will work out why? But because that does explain why this uh, inflection takes place. And that is fundamentally is the role of uh, government, the role of uh, investment in social uh, programs like education, health. And so there's the income transfer that takes place through this progressive taxation and redistribution effects that do the countries become more democratic, politically more uh, 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 responsive to the issues of poverty and all that. And all of those actions then help to sort of reduce this inequality. So in, in the, the other, well, the previous economists were sort of still talking about Adam Smith's hidden hand. Could that was actually implying that there is a sort of a visible hand at the role of a government in, in reducing the income inequality. So in that sense, um, Kuznet was probably, I mean, he, he um, he sort of uh, uh, helps to keep the capitalist economy and uh, some faith in the capitalist economy as long as it has been gone through the political uh, uh, transformations. 
uh, was actually quite good. Um, now, it turns out that there are some <clears throat> other, uh, you see, the Kundeskab didn't deal with so much in space or um, uh, uh, it was more, more of a sectoral kind of, even talked about urban, uh, it was rural, so those are more sectoral concepts than spatial concepts. But William Alonso, uh, a well-known planner, he actually wrote a very nice article called the, the Five Bell Curves of Development. And so he added these four other bell curves. One is the population growth, urbanization, urban primacy, and regional disparity. They all go through this kind of a uh, bell-shaped uh, development uh, tra trajectory. Um, so now we have a, uh, uh, a another uh, a sixth bell curve, which is called the environmental Kuznets curve, where they're now talking about how the environmental degradation uh, would increase with economic development and the new industrial economy, maybe in the post-industrial economy, that degradation actually will begin to begin to decline uh, because of uh, collective action, government action, public policy, uh, technological uh, uh, measures to control pollution and things like that. Uh, the reason I'm using this bell curve, and I did put a chapter on tables of bell curve, because it has some implications for, I think, city design that will come back at the very end. So, uh, and then there are some other uh, images or, or arguments of like the one chapter I uh, devote to uh, alternative images of development, not the economic development, but development and the autonomy you know, dependency, development sustainability, development as freedom, as Amartya Shen has argued. Um, and then I'm going to just broad categories of uh, literature and this chapter on urban form and urbanism. But I, I sort of thought that how would we, uh, if we had to map the effect of development, urban outcomes of development, what we might we use as a kind of a structure or framework? So this is something as I propose a framework for looking at the uh, effect of development on uh, the human experience and particularly in urban setting. So identity, um, and the habits use icons, brands, power, habitus, which has to the habits, ritual, fields, disposition, urbanism, atmosphere, pace of life, diversity, et cetera. Social ecology, the distribution of people in class, race, status, built environment, sensorium, sound, smell, wind, heat, cold, and what we call the nature services, location, geography, climate, topography. And I'll argue and show, come back to this chart later where I show how the, uh, the development uh, or absence thereof has affected. So the canonical city, I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly. This is the ideal Chinese city form. And this is Madurai in India. Uh, they say that it took a millennium to Chinese to perfect their ideal city. And the, the ideal city uh, is, was very much associated with the concept of development, as I argue. In fact, you know, the, in the book, famous book with Italo Calvino and Invisible City, which is really imaginary discussion between Marco Polo and uh, Kublai Khan, the, uh, the one uh, uh, ruler of China, actually Mongol ruler of China, uh, who was always very uh, uns uh, uncertain about how he was doing. So he wanted to know how are the Chinese cities doing compared to other cities, because the cities were seen as a measure of progress, as a measure of development. So in that sense, the urban design, city design is very much linked to the notion of development, I argue, in these chapters. This is the, uh, the Islamic cities thing. You have a, um, the um, Fes, Medina, uh, to the left, and uh, this is in Esfahan, 
uh, it's amazing to think of how, what, how the design worked in order to align the Qibla orientation. Uh, they had to, uh, which is at 45 degrees to the main uh, courtyard, the, the, the main open space had to be shifted like about some 13.5 or 6 degrees to the from the true north and it was all done very very carefully so that the Qibla orientation would remain the same. So I have a section on this chapter is who was at the is there a kind of canonical uh, form of Islamic cities and I didn't find anything except that this Qibla orientation in many instances um, uh, could be seen one facet to it. So in the colonial project, this is the, uh, by the way, the, uh, the cartoon uh, to the right is the key for the cover uh, of the book, which is a painting um, done by uh, a woman named Marjorie Schumacher. This is way back in 1930 something, 31, 32, illustrated the London uh, Weekly, which was a special issue uh, when the uh, New Delhi formally became the new cap capital of British India. And uh, this is uh, barely uh, 20, 25 years before India became independent. But uh, the, this, the map also is drawn by the same, same artist. And here, this drawing very clearly shows the colonial the project in the developing world, which always has a done very clearly, distinctly from the anything that's indigenous and native. And here in this case, in the Baroque design, which is very much reminiscent of Pierre Lafont's design for DC, and Sajanabad, which uh, you, know, you can see my arrow here, cursor is the is the seventh uh, Delhi, which is the the Mughal uh, capital of Delhi. Uh, the seven previous dynasties in, were, uh, so this was the eighth Delhi, and of course now the contemporary Delhi is the ninth Delhi. Uh, so this, this, this beginning to shows that the separation, um, uh, what you call the cordon sanitaire in French, is something that was maintained by just in every other uh, uh, colonial uh, cities built in, in the developing in the global south, French, um, uh, Italian, and uh, and earlier even you know, the Spanish influence in Latin America. So the next chapter devoted to post-colonial Ethiopia, Chandigarh, Brasilia, and these are some of the two recent uh, pictures of um, from Chandigarh, uh, which has now going through kind of an Indianization of Chandigarh. Uh, it's uh, shared by, the capital is shared by two states, but it is also under its own union territory. And uh, one thing that the union territory government has done has planted a lot of trees and foliage, and which has softened the harsh concrete of Corbu. Uh, obviously, these are architectural masterpieces of all time. Um, the Assembly House and Secretariat Building. Um, and then uh, uh, the other paradigm was the civic design that came from um, uh, this from Gordon Cullen, who was invited by Ford Foundation to plan uh, uh, planning a master plan of Delhi. And he did some very interesting sort of connecting, trying to connect the old Delhi and uh, the new Delhi across that big expanse of space through uh, new forms of uh, shopping, civic centers, and other kinds of public uses. Um, so that, that was going to be, in some ways, they, in India, they were looking for, they were disappointed a little bit by the Ford Foundation team's effort who brought this kind of a very rational planning model, uh, but they're not, there's not much to say about the city design. And when you think about it, they came in the, to US, I mean to India in, in the 50s, uh, 
60s around that time. Um, but they didn't think about Kevin Lynch or Appleyard or all of the other city designers. They went instead to uh, to get Gordon Cullen to come and design the cities. Anyways, I think I think Cullen did a good job. Um, so the other chapter is devoted to this, what I call the Faustian development, again, taken from Marshall Berman, notion of the Goethe's Faust is, a, is one of the classic emblem of the tragedy of development. You demolish everything that's old and sort of start completely new, everything has to go, everything has to be changed. So this is a picture to the right by Fang Wong uh, of a uh, building, courtyard housing in was demolished in Beijing, um, and the, on the left is the Ram Kul House, famous building for um, uh, Chinese television uh, uh, corporation. Um, poverty. Uh, this is, of course, is a little bit of an older uh, picture of uh, Sabarmati River uh, settlements uh, on the banks of Sabarmati River in Ahmedabad. Now, all the slums are taken out. In fact, you, you, can, you can see the beginning of the clearance happening and they're building a, 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 a kind of retaining wall, kind of a dam. This is, has become you know, already in part, this has already been done on the other side of the river and is becoming a very broad open promenade and um, shopping malls and um, interesting and admittedly, arguably, a very nice uh, public space, but uh, at the cost of removing these uh, squatters. Um, and then uh, the other form of, I mean, in this, this is the, the to the right hand side, the neighborhood we call the Gandhi's neighborhood. This is the, uh, the Sabarmati ashram is um, surrounded by, used to be surrounded by a lot of these old villages as the city expanded. They became um, uh, busties or slums. But I just wanted to point out that there is a kind of a satellite dish here for Tata, which means that some, some improvement in the status of the poor is, is happening, maybe some trickling down going on. But still, it's very much remains a major problem within most cities. Medina, which is uh, this in this case uh, focus on uh, Fez Medina, but this is a case study of the old cities, um, the heritage of the old cities. And in case of uh, this, this is Medina, Fez Medina is a very important, interesting story in the sense that they are still very much like they have medieval guilds. Uh, so this is a uh, tannery leather makers. Um, Guild, which shows the vats of uh, where they're uh, um, coloring the uh, the leather, uh, not very healthy, and the problems of lots of problems with pollution and all that. But and there is some architectural rendering. I mean, uh, improvement that has been done in restoration of the Fez Medina. So that's so the um, uh, uh, level of so again now returning to that that. The chart. Uh, what has happened then? The urban art becomes in the global economy. That identity has become a kind of an asset, wannabe hyper reality. Habitats has become confused and declining. Urbanism has become more transitional, provisional, or even missing. The social ecology is still evolving. It's still situational, lumpy. The form has become more fragmented, splintered, and polarized. Sensorium has become atrophying and debilitating. I mean, if you look at the pollution of Delhi or Beijing, uh, it's largely uninhabitable, but that's the, that's the uh, cost of, of the, on the urban sensorium. And the nature services, the natural context has become neglected, abused, uh, irreversibly depleted and endangered. Um, so I end by looking at some scenarios for the future 
if you don't do anything, one is in this kind of an airstead city from Dubai in the middle of a desert. There is like a Hollywood uh, a billboard of a panorama of uh, Disneylandish uh, attraction soon to come. I'm not clear what it is. Maybe maybe it is a development uh, planned community. Maybe it's entertainment district. Not sure, but it's completely in the barren desert landscape. Hybrid city, this is one of the China's nine town, uh, one city plan. This is the one uh, Huyang, uh, which used to be part of the, the kind of Delta uh, region of the Wang, Wangpu River. And so <clears throat> they um, thought that uh, this might be candidate for something like Venice. So this is, uh, they actually invited Italian architect Gregotti, 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 I think is the name, uh, company, firm, who uh, designed this uh, <clears throat> new town, which is uh, kind of interlaced with uh, these uh, canals, some existing, some uh, created. To, so this is a sort of a new Venice. It's not quite the, like the architecture of Venice, but it's kind of a theme of Venice. So this is what they call the town of the hybrid city. The Palimpsa city is the, this is very common in, in Rome is probably the greatest example of the Palimpsa city. But here in Luxor, as you can see, it's an interesting, um, you have a, um, this is the, the classic ancient Egyptian architecture temple. And right here, if you can see carefully, there's a little mosque which is built within the, on the top of the ruins of the earlier uh, classic Egyptian uh, temple. And, uh, and further down, I don't know if you can see it, I, is a um, kind of Holiday Inn type modern hotel structure. Then there's a dualistic antipodic city, which uh, this is from Ipanema and Tatagnera, I think neighborhood in Brazil or in Rio, um, sort of the, the contrasting the polar opposites of two types of forms of development. Um, and then let's talk about finally the bricolage city and the mega regions and mega urban sprawls. The bricolage city is the tradition in the third world of making do. You have lots of stuff available you can put it together in some, somehow. So this a picture from on the left is a street scene and a Cairo, this building. Literally, uh, there's, a, there's no code uh, or no formal engineering uh, involvement in the build, uh, building of, it's almost sort of built like a handicraft. Here is an example of how a truck uh, engine has been converted to outboard motors for in, this is in Bangkok, okay, into uh, in Thailand. Uh, in Calcutta, you're getting your uh, internet cables are being uh, <laughs> provided in the outside of the uh, building, you know, using the lamppost. And uh, so these are the kind of emerging cityscapes that shows, this is very typical of most developing global south. This is kind of making do with uh, limited resources, but uh, some, you know, uh, um, creativity and putting things together. Um, so that might be also a tradition. And then finally, the going back to the bell curve again. So, um, well, before that, we. We may want to think about uh, from the future discussions, all that it's the only question of development and freedom and Kevin Lynch's performance characteristics of uh, uh, I, you know, good city forms. Lynch, if you read Kevin's writing, he talks about roles, John Rawls, and he mentioned, but he never uh, mentioned Shen because I don't think he knew him or Shen was. I uh, started writing about development. In fact, the, the, the book Development as Freedom came much later, you know, long after uh, 
Lynch uh, passed away. Um, so there is a, there's some future thinking we can do about that. But then there is a seventh bell curve uh, uh, notion, which is that the city design, perhaps from a beginning or even more endogenous, autonomous, sustainable form of city, which gradually with economic development and globalization become more exogenous with a more larger Western dependency, but that dependency might ultimately level off and you might begin to see again the emergence of endogenous autonomous uh, sustainability. So then finally, this question about, so what's wrong with uh, copy? Don't we all copy? Even the West copies. I mean, Disneyland is basically copies of different things. And when Umberto Eco wrote that wonderful uh, book, uh, Travels in Hyperreality, he did talk about how the Disneyland, uh, how it was wonderful about Disneyland that you can go to the uh, Disneyland, you have the crocodile uh, in the in the river bank, they will show up when your, your boat goes by. But you could do the same trip in uh, New Orleans, uh, Mississippi. They, the guide would say, well, yeah, we have crocodiles. Uh, they are there, but they're not here now. <laughs> but you can see sometimes they're there. So the nature is much more unpredictable, but the the artificial, the artif uh, the, the fake is more predictable. So, so what's wrong with fake? What's wrong with copying? What I mean, after all, wouldn't you rather have a? Uh, in, in fact, when I going back to my Indonesia visit, my second visit, I did manage to meet up with the developer. He's a young architect, and so I asked him, "So why why did you?" I mean, it was kind of hard to ask him. Uh, what, what are you thinking or what are you smoking when you came up with those ideas? So he sort of got my, uh, the drift of my question. He said, well, you know, these are some established forms and images and uh, architecture that has worked in other places. So why not just use them? So basically saying, well, what's the point? I mean, why wouldn't you rather have a, good copy than a bad original. Um, because otherwise, if you leave it to the local talent, they'll come up with the, the original, which are pretty bad. So, so this question, I think, in a way, also is raised by this uh, wonderful uh, quote, which uh, uh, by uh, Antonia Pia, which includes the quote from Salman Rusty, which is the yellow. The, the ideal of contamination has few exponents more eloquent than Salman Rushdie, who has insisted that the novel that occasioned his fatwa celebrates hybridity, impurity, intermingling, the transformation that comes of new and unexpected combinations of human beings, cultures, ideas, politics, movies, songs. He rejoices in mongrelization and fears the absolutism of the pure. Malage, hodgepodge, a bit of this, a bit of that, is how newness enters the world. So uh, Piaque says, no doubt there can be an easy and spurious utopianism of mixture, as there is of purity and authenticity, and yet the larger human truth is on the side of contamination, the endless process of imitation and revision. So this, I use that as an epigraph of my last chapter. And I, I could stop here. I, I, I have some few, in the epilogue, I have some best practices. Uh, if you want, I can quickly go through them. Uh, the rehabilitated Bund of Shanghai, which has become a wonderful uh, public space. Um, you are Hutong in Beijing, and designed by Professor Wu Liang Yang who kept telling the Chinese authorities that, listen, there is a different way of doing things. We can, we can, we know how to do modern architecture. And then finally, they kind of said, all right, this person would go see you, show us what, what you can do. So they gave it one chunk of um, old uh, uh, district in the northern, uh, north of the Forbidden City. Uh, and he developed this wonderful uh, uh, 
we were put on the housing, but nothing has happened. 798 Art District is also a story of an industrial plant that was abandoned, but the, the artist moved in and made them a, a kind of a artist studio. The government was not going to let that happen, but eventually they, they caved in and they allowed this to become a uh, established art district and a very popular place to visit. Um, it's a rock garden in Chandigarh story, you may know. The next chance, the government official uh, who used to uh, collect um, this uh, detritus of previous settlements in Chandigarh, when Chandigarh was a builder, some old villages and other uh, settlements there, when they were all demolished, they came, so there's all kinds of garbage, broken glasses, bottles, uh, this porcelain insulation pods and stuff like that and he used to collect them and uh you know in his bicycle he used to take them and deposit them in this otherwise uh, used to be a kind of a nature preserve area unbuilt in the original plan and then uh then he actually built some wonderful sculptures and stuff and then finally somebody found out about it and what is remarkable about this thing in, in a place like India, one of the things that immediately the bureaucracy said, well, no, you cannot do this, this is public land. And instead they accepted that. Not only they accepted that, he had it about 15 acres of land where he worked on it. They made it a, a formal rock garden now that expands, extends over 175 acres. And it's a wonderful place for uh, people to visit. This is probably, if you ever go to Chandigarh, Rock Garden, I think, is a better first day, should be your first destination before you go pay your homage to Le Corbusier. Um, the uh, Medellin Comuna Tercero in Medellin is where they uh, build this escalator on the hillside. It's a wonderful public uh, improvement to finally giving some improving the accessibility of the hillside settlements. Um, and uh, this is the Transmillennium in Bogota. It's a, basically a BRT, <clears throat> but very uh, effectively done. Uh, and it's part of Bogota's uh, Transmillennial. They also have a system of public spaces that has converted a lot of the old streets and uh, made them into wonderful uh, public. Uh, the Fez Medina restoration was. Another thing, best practice, and John Mark Amitabad, which is also a BRT, largely uh, designed by uh, planning professors at SEPT University. And um, they're able to do very quickly and uh, uh, with very low cost and rather creative way of integrating with the existing street system. Um, anyway, so. Uh, and then there's the, my last item was the the legacy of Patrick Geddes. I don't have any picture for that, but that was my 10th best practice. So let me just stop here and um, open up for discussion. I don't know how much time I took, probably more than I needed. But. Thank you, Trinip. We have uh, about 20 minutes left. So we have, we have ample time for questions from the audience and uh, for conversation amongst our, our guests here today. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Arthi, are there, are there any questions that we want to share from the audience at this point, or do we want to move to a moderated conversation? I think we can move to a moderated conversation as we wait for questions to come in. So Bish, would you yes. like to kick things off? Sure, sure. Um, well, I want to first uh, thank Trudeep for this presentation for his book, which uh, which actually reflect, reflects his uh, long experience in working both in design and also in on development issues. Um, I don't have much to add, except that I do want to really go back to the issue of the bell curves that you sort of used to define development and the relationships uh, in development, like between urbanization and 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 development etc the four five bell curves that you have 
And you have a similar bell curve now that you are proposing on design. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to push you a bit on that, on that curve that you put forward. And the two axes that you have, and the one axis is, of course, um, I think it goes authenticity versus dependency on the vertical axis. Yeah. And then development on the on the vertical axis, right? Horizontal yeah. axis. Yeah. That that curve. Yeah. Can you go and, back? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway, the point, the question is that um, the the, indi the the indicators of urban design uh, share with us why authenticity and dependency are the two critical variables for you because you plotted them on the on the vertical axis. Um, and at the same, let me just say, and at the same time. You put up Anthony Apaya's quote on on contamination, which I actually was fascinated by because I had looked at it a bit in my book on comparative planning cultures, where there was always influence from outside in every country that we looked at. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, but the nature of interactions between the countries, of course, led to that. So I want to ask you a little bit more on that curve. Are there other ways of defining what happens to urban design with development. Yeah. So, uh, shall I, can I leave it? I, I kept, okay. Um, you know, yeah, this, the idea of this bell curve, this seven bell curve, was actually uh, brought up by a couple of different occasions when I make a presentation. Um, one in Cardiff, another in Bellagio. They said, well, I'm so you, have you thought about maybe there is a seventh bell curve where, which is a kind of a cultural kind of bell curve where, um, you know, these things you are um, kind of bemoaning of the loss of uh, kind of sustainability and, uh, and uh, kind of a um, sort of the indigenous, um, uh, authenticity and all that, that that will ultimately will happen again once uh, with the continued economic development and, and this same kind of intervention from the government to the state or, or, or just uh, the process. Now that, yeah, so this doesn't actually um, quite take into account the contamination side of it which is, um, which I guess is the, I, I don't know if it's a parallel curve or not. I, I don't, I obviously by presenting these, I have made myself exposed to criticism. Um, so because why, what, why are you so engaged, involved with kind of a, some kind of authenticity and endogeneity? What's wrong with exogeneity? If it's if it this is the nature way, uh, innovations newness comes about. So uh, I, I raise, as I said, this is a conversation, right? Beginning of a conversation. So I may I present this uh, the argument as uh, and also the counter. I don't. I, I'm not sure. I have a, a very well structured answer. Um, but uh, but are you asking uh, Bish about that the the axis itself that the axis may be defined differently or yeah I'm thinking about the, the whether we should think of other other um, things to identify the axes uh -huh. and and the reason is because I was thinking as one factor that's uh, you didn't respond today but I think it's in your book uh, the use of information technology now. Yeah, this is a very different technology and ideas spread in a very different way now than before. Right. And so uh, one would think that if you're expressing the outcome as a result of infusion of ideas, mm -hmm. then the rate of infusion, which is based on technology, would be a factor. Right. Yeah. 
And so that's one. The second is, I think, the authenticity, the anxiety about authenticity and dependency, which uh, Apaya is trying to break, right? By through saying contamination is not that bad, contamination is real, right? Okay. It, can have, it can be good. He's saying it can be good. Yeah. So if we do buy that and you put that up, then what is the significance of the curve where dependency, where you have your dependence western dependency increases and then begins to go down yeah well um the, the difference might be that uh i mean one form of contamination is a kind of a wholesale um kind of acceptance of something that's done because it's just strict copying like mm. uh, like like the, the chinese nine town city it's kind of a uh, and, and also, um, it's, it's interesting how they're affecting the lives of the people there. And, and uh, you know, they, 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 they go to the, the, the Thames town, which is designed like the British town. The, uh, the, the, the newlywed couples go there to get their picture taken in front of this old British uh, town square. And so, um, so this is a kind of a uh, uh, this, but this is not contamination or in terms of newness. Nothing is happening. But I think what Apea is and uh, the rest of you are saying that uh, this, um, uh, I mean, we, in a way, my bricolage city uh, argument is is where I think that many of the the uh, you know when you go to Cuba there. In Cuba, you still see these old Studebakers from the 1950s. They're still running. So basically, all the original uh, machines are all gone. They have just rebuilt it they come from scratch in the local foundries, right? That they did, used to do that in India too. So that kind of ingenuity and skill that can um, tinker with some, with, you know, stuff and redo it. I mean, that that's the kind of creativity um, that I, I think we should all hope for. And the contamination, I think both Kisa Apia and Kisa are saying that, uh, you know, again, the sort of utopian, utopian, kind of a fake utopianism of uh, pure puritanism of pure purity, that we should not worry about that. Instead, we should be open to uh, ideas uh, and, and as indeed in, 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 for example, in Los Angeles, I mean, there are some amazing, uh, this is some of the restaurants are coming up with some great food that are all fusion food that, you know, pita fajita, right? You have a pita bread and you have Mexican fajita, stick it in there and sandwich. You have a pita that might be a California specialty trip, but not quite made it to Boston. You haven't come to Boston yet? Well, so... Uh, so we, you know, those are um, uh, those are sort of the you know the examples of and, and in in arts, in music, and you know there is a um, the uh, I remember the first time I listened to this um, um, hip hop and bhangra music <laughs> combined. Uh, it's quite quite. Uh, Quite impressive, interesting. So, so I think that there is problem. So the, these this axis, maybe the vertical axis, maybe um, um, and then also the economic development. Maybe it's not that it's not only the economic development because the economic development could lead to more more purity stuff. But is uh, the low level of economic development, you're likely to see more of that kind of adaptation and changes and uh, kind of hodgepodge and reuse of materials and things like that. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think it, it's um, you know I don't I don't have a definitive answer to that, but uh, I think these are kind of interesting thoughts. To keep in mind for those who are interested in the design uh, and, and development connection. Thank you. Arati, back to you. Yeah. 
Um, I think, you know, just continuing with this conversation, and I know you speak to this a little bit in your book, um, you know, on the one hand, we, we do have, I think, uh, with, in thinking about city form and development within the profession, sort of validization of the endogenous city. Um, and like you sort of highlight with, and, you know, especially through your discussions of gated communities, this is often sort of accompanied by a quest for modernity that is associated in some ways with an aspiration for the Western um, and for being Westernized. Um, I'm curious as to how you see the role of the planner, especially since, you know, today this talk is being attended by um, essentially folks that are planners, um, architects, urban designers. How do you see the role of the planner, I think, in navigating these various ambitions? in thinking about the notion of an ideal city? Yeah, um, that's the difficult question, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, the, um, I, I always go back to, uh, to Lisa Pitti's, um, uh, I think she wrote a wonderful critique on the urban designers, what the urban designers do. Uh, and she corresponded, she had with her, Brother, I forget which. In, I think it's the book on uh, on uh, Ciudad Guayana. Yeah, you know, and he, he she talked about the the um, two approach to to design: the Platonic approach and the Apollonian approach. The Platonic approach is all very formal, and you know, all like in Plato, who actually came up with a pretty specific number for ideal city size and things like that. Aristotle, even though the student of Plato was more organic, open-ended, pluralistic, um, not full kind of a deterministic in, in some ways. So I think in planning, uh, we we are generally as planning profession, we are more Aristotelian in, uh, in modern times, and I guess you say, yeah, and hope, hopefully you continue to be that way. And so in that Aristotelian uh, approach, I think you can make room for that kind of changes um, or um, uh, so your point was uh, the, um, the how, how to make this kind of a hybridity, the contact possible more contamination. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to, you know, one could formalize it. I mean, the beauty of this contamination is that they are more uh, just individual um, initiatives and things like that. Uh, I, I think, you know, go back to Kevin's work and um, I think this is something, um, I mean, if you look at these performance characteristics of good city form, one form was control that uh, the, to give the people the um, power and right to do or control their environment, change the environment as they can. So that that kind of engagement of the users in you know shaping, managing, maintaining the environment is is very much um, part of his theme. I mean, how how you actually um, um, codify it? <laughs> I'm not sure in terms of planning rules and guidelines. Um, but, you know, the design charrettes, participatory kinds of um, processes might be placed where you can, you can, you can encourage some of that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Um, we have a question from um, a member of the audience. Um, how do you see uh, future utility of the term the global south, particularly in light of China's rise um, with the emergence of alternative urban models and various nationalisms in many of the countries in this region? Uh, and so what is the beginning of the question? How do you see the future utility of the term global south? Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and there is no doubt that the global, some parts of global cells are doing very well. <laughs> in fact, uh, 
think in some of these countries, maybe there is a kind of a, their internal global north and global south uh, uh, emerging. In China, that is certainly the, the case. I mean, when you look at China, the face of China, which are all the shiny buildings and uh, high-speed rail and um, subways and um, uh, fancy cars and, you know, all of that um, signs of obvious prosperity. But then there is also it's kind of a uh, dark side, uh, the Noah side, that is sunshine and the, the metaphor. There is also you know, so the rural poverty. And, and, and the Chinese government uh, is aware of that. And in fact, they, they have, you know, the new Chinese policy is basically, they want to urbanize the entire country because they think that's the way they can get rid of the, of the poverty. So, um, <clears throat> um, so the, I think the interesting question about the global south is that other than uh, income differences, are there some other kind of fundamentally culture? So is this the ways of West? So we call the global North largely as the West, and global South is the non-West. Um, is that distinction breaking down? I mean, that may be the question. I mean, so, but uh, I don't know. I mean, one could possibly see that the West, uh, um, I mean, I mean, or maybe so. The the this global south, if is defined by other than income and economy, uh, it, it could be um, still some unique, distinctive part of the global south that would be always different from the global west. Um, <clears throat> Some of it could be uh, the function of, uh, uh, I think, you know, if you read the stuff from Jared Diamond and uh, the uh, Jeffrey Sachs and, uh, who, who tried to sort of help out the global south or the developing world, saying that they are uh, basically, they're, they're less endowed in, in terms of resources and something God actually made a distinction, deliberate choice between the global south. So, you, so the global south have enough resources, enough uh, opportunities. The, many of the African countries are landlocked, so they don't have the ability to uh, engage in uh, global economic, economic uh, functions and things like that. So, so there are some geographical, climatic, uh, uh, which are fixed and constant, to the extent those have shaped the culture of global south, was that that will also get kind of a uh, wiped away by the changes in the economy. That's an interesting question, and and the probably more interesting question normatively whether we want to do that or we want to keep that distinction, uh, and if so. Uh, how? I mean, you know, just, uh, you know, putting some dragon's head on the eaves of your <laughs> office building or putting a little cupola over your modern architecture. It's not obviously the way to go. Um, so, um, those are interesting question. I mean, that's the sort of the challenges of city design. Um, Thank you, Trudip. Thank you so much. Your your reflections and ideas uh, in this book are so valuable to uh, academics and to practitioners. Our, our students have had a very interesting time discussing your ideas, and I think what you shared with us today really sets up not only um, answers, of course, but continues a series of questions that will, I think, challenge the urban design field as we confront what may be renewed globalization in the wake of the COVID pandemic. We will see, but I think many of the forces that you talk about will continue. Many of these dilemmas will continue as well. And uh, we're moving into a very interesting period where 
this idea of this global image that you talk about so provocatively, um, maybe it, we need to challenge it even more strongly than we have in the past. And I think your book gives us some very, uh, very valuable ideas for that. So Trudup, thanks for speaking about your book and the images of development. I want to encourage our audience to read this book, whether it's at your local library, online, or of course the printed volume from MIT Press is a beautifully printed volume. And congratulations. Oh, it was wonderful to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.